Thank you, Anisha. Should I <clears throat> take it away? Of course, go for it. Excellent. Well, look, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And as Anisha says, um, you're looking at different aspects of, you know, quantum computing per se. And I come, I feel quite fortunate that I come to quantum computing with a, with a reasonable computer background, but with a very strong um, cos cosmology background. I've studied cosmology for 30 years now. And cosmology, the universe, black holes, dark matter, dark energy, all of that stuff leads on to quantum physics. And the, uh, what this presentation is about um, it is teaching you the underlying quantum physics behind quantum computing. And I relate the two together during the presentation, which I think um, it is great because a lot of computing people were used to saying things like, oh, if you measure the qubit, it collapses to uh, one or zero with equal probability. Well, what does that mean? You look at Born's law, which says um, any moment in the superposition can, we can work out the probability as is the absolute value of the complex amplitude coefficient squared. Where does that come from? So I'll explain the underlying tenets of quantum physics. And somebody there is uh, unmuted. You probably need to mute because uh, I can hear your m microphone and things. Okay, well, look, let's, um, let's get straight into it. Oh, there's a where it doesn't exist, it's Quaqua, sorry about that. I changed my slide just five minutes before the presentation, which I shouldn't have done. I just wanted to mention <clears throat> that I have Quaqua as my company, as Anisha says. I'm the founder and operator of Quaqua, which is the Quantum Education Center of West Australia, where I live. And every Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., hosted on Quantum Appalooza with Tell France, um, I have a quantums and answers session where we talk about a certain topic and then we have questions about that topic and any other questions anybody may have. And on the subject of questions, um, Anisha's um, keeping a look out for any questions and will interrupt me if um, she sees a particularly good one. I won't be looking at the chat all the time because I'll focus on the presentation, but every so often I'll stop and ask for questions. And when it comes to questions, I, I ask you this, the purpose of this presentation is to engage people who are new to the subject into quantum physics and quantum computing. So the last thing we need is an exceptionally um, high level advanced technical question, which puts everybody off. So when you ask a question, always think, is it for the benefit of the group? I think that's important. I mean, I'll always, if it's a, a, an advanced question, you can always uh, DM me and I'll always answer you. But I'm very conscious of going slowly so that the whole group can stay focused. I hate to lose people. I'm a university lecturer. I've lectured for many years. And I used to pride myself on knowing that I wasn't losing people in the audience because I've been there in the presentation and I'm really interested but because of somebody asking a very technical question, which makes them feel better, but not the whole group. So let's get all of that out of the way. And now I'm going to talk about today's presentation. And <clears throat> it's essentially, I'm going to talk about two quantum physics pivotal experiments that you that are fundamental to the way quantum computers work um, it's it's and these experiments honestly they're so fantastic now the double slit is the first one um, which is it's called in scientific communities it's actually called 
the beautiful experiment. And that's because it's been around for so long and it's very easy to say what happens. It's very difficult to say what's going on in the background. And I might mention these two experiments have been done millions of times and they are scientifically uh, uh, completely established, peer reviewed and accepted. These experiments happen. And what I, what I will tell you happens in these experiments is science. Now the interpret this is quantum me mechanics and quantum physics. Um, what is actually happening is called an interpretation. And I'm gonna talk about one very good interpretation, which is consciousness. Now, Aristotle said 2000 years ago, the one thing we'll never understand is the consciousness of human beings. And he's got a, he's got a point, I guess. Uh, we're, we're not that much further ahead to where we were even back then. It, it's amazing. We don't understand whether the brain controls consciousness or whether consciousness has always been there and we're somehow tapping into it. Uh, I'll be talking about the universal conscious way, universal consciousness, which is a wave function that we're all part of. We just don't know we're part of it. And that's really uh, wonderful. But look, let's go on to the double slits. So I'm going to talk about this for about 20 minutes. This is, wow, it's fantastic. Now, that's not me. That is uh, Professor Thomas Young in 1801. The double slit was first performed in 1801. Um, I might add, Professor Young didn't realize how important this experiment was gonna be. But I'd like to explain the history of it. It's sort of, what happened was back in 1801, um, we weren't sure what light was fundamentally empirically composed of. Was it a wave, like a sound wave? Or was it a corpuscle or a particle as Isaac Newton suggested it was? Now, this guy, Thomas Young, he, um, the, the designed this experiment where he let a very little gap in his curtain so that a very the smallest ray of light he could possibly get would hit I might uh, excuse me a second I'll just put it in I'll just annotate my mouse so you can see what I'm talking about the smallest um, ray of light would come in here and he would it would hit a front screen, which had two very, 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 very tiny slits in them. Uh, these are just shown uh, so large for illustrative purposes, but the actual slits were very, very small. And then he had a background screen detector where he would see the result of the ray going through the first screen. Now, the point to note is this interference screen at the back. Now, if it's got many stripes in it, uh, vertical stripes in it, it's what we call an interference pattern. So it's important you understand the um, back detector screen is the big thing. That's what he was looking at to see whether it was an interference pattern like this, which would suggest light, well, it would prove light is a wave rather than if there were only two vertical lines, which is a clump pattern. So let me, what, what am I saying? The detector will show either a way, uh, multiple lines, which means it's a, light is a wave, or it will show two vertical lines, which um, imagine if you had a machine gun in front of the first detector here and you were firing bullets 
you would just expect to see two lines at the back. So that was the important thing that he wanted to do. He did the experiment and it came up with an interference pattern and he immediately ran around the laboratory waving his hand, I've solved the problem. Light is a wave, just like sound. And everybody, it, it was conclusive. There's no question. It's a wave interference pattern. And for a hundred years, that was the science until, let me get my mouse back, until this great man, who you all know, I'm sure, Einstein in 19, um, 19, well, 1912 or 1905, around that period, um, Einstein came up with this new fantastic experiment called the photoelectric effect. And actually that's what he got his Nobel Prize for. In, in the one year, I'm not doing well in my years here because I'm pretty sure it's 1905. I mean, the actual year doesn't matter. But he had a... Uh, Annus Miraculous, which is the year of miracles, where he submitted four pivotal white papers. And um, usually somebody will do one in a lifetime and he did four in the one year. Uh, his spe special theory of relativity, uh, Brownian motion is another one, and the photoelectric effect. Now, uh, all he did was shone uh, a light at a, a metal, and it gave off an electron. Now, when they increased the intensity of the light, if it was a wave, you'd expect to see more electrons jump off, but no matter what, they couldn't do it. And this proved definitively that light was a particle. Whoa. So what does that mean? And uh, Einstein, first thing he said was, I'm not saying Thomas Young was wrong a hundred years ago. He's definitely right because we've done that experiment thousands of times. So it was strange. Is light a wave or a particle? And then we get onto the double slit because what happened was that we got the technology where we could send one photon at a time. And that, that scientists again were absolutely, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to solve it now. Light has this strange, what's called wave particle duality. And Einstein said, look, this is ridiculous. In fact, every scientist said, this is ridiculous. It, we don't know when light is a particle and when it is a wave. So they were looking at the double slit and what they did was they sent through one electron at a time, or it, it, a photon actually. Um, we're talking about any subatomic particle. So an electron's fine, uh, a photon is fine, a photon's easier to work with because it's polarization rather than your spin. But look, that doesn't matter. The important thing was they sent a photon of light. Now the photon is the empirical unit of light. And we got to the stage where we could send one at a time. So the scientists were all excited because they said, what we'll do is we'll put a camera on the slit and then we can see um, it going through the slit, and we can see how it interferes with itself. Because it's very strange, because when they were doing one at a time, they could see it still had an interference pattern at the back over time. So somehow, one photon was interfering with itself. So they put the camera up, and look what happened at the back screen. The back screen, and I'll just make sure I'll put the spotlight on again. The back screen changed to two vertical lines. This was staggering. <clears throat> you take the camera away, 
And as soon as you take the camera away, it, the interference pattern came back. And it was as quick as that. Camera there, clump. Camera gone, interference. It was unbelievable. <clears throat> and, you know, scientists really didn't know what to make of this. This is absolutely strange. And they realized that we could not observe what was going on. And I'd like to stress, and this is again beyond the spews, we had the technology to find out what was going on. It was nature that was not allowing us to know. Nature said, look, if you're not looking, we're gonna be away. But if you try and look, or if you try and find out what's going on, we will stop sending a wave and there will be a particle so that you can't examine or interrogate what is happening. It appeared to be, if we know what slit it went through, and if we know what's called, and you need to remember this for later on when we're talking the delayed choice, but if you know the which way, the path that the photon has taken, if we know that, or if we have the capacity to know that, then it will what's called collapse the wave function. So what we realized was when the photon is going towards the slit, in fact, at any stage, even after it's gone through the slit, as soon it is in a super position. And what you have to remember is that scientists were amazed when they, when they went, and, and quantum just means subatomic, basically. So the quantum world is anything smaller than the atom. And I might add that all of us are quantum objects. Um, it, it makes me laugh when sometimes people say, oh, look, this happens in the quantum world. But in the real world, the world that we live in, which is often called the classical world or, or Newtonian world, um, this, the classical Newtonian world is an emergent property of quantum physics. That is the real, the fundamental law of the universe is quantum physics. It's a bit like the electromagnetic scale. We could only see a really, I think it's two or three percent of the actual electromagnetic spectrum. The visible spectrum bandwidth is very small. Um, so it, it's a similar thing. So when scientists managed to go subatomic, they were amazed. They found that the full fundamental forces in Newtonian physics, which is electro, uh, electromagnetism, gravity, the strong nuclear, which is made of gluons and keeps um, atoms together, you know, um, the protons and the neutrons through gluons. And then you've got the weak nuclear force, which, which is radiation. So uranium and plutonium and it, it emits radiation. Those forces didn't exist, but they were, they were new forces and they were strange forces. Um, and one of them, there basically are three, quantum entanglement, superpositioning, and quantum tunneling. Now quantum tunneling is, is where um, subatomic particles can walk through walls, basically. It's how um, birds do migration is a mixture of quantum entanglement and quantum tunneling. And in your brain, it's quantum tunneling is becoming a big, big thing. Not all information goes through the synapses of the, in, in, in the brain. And uh, we, we must do a session on that one day in Asia. But 
the two that I'll be talking about today is super positioning and entanglement. And super positioning is the state a uh, particle, a photon, an electron, a subatomic particle is in until it's observed. So now you would have been taught at school, uh, I certainly was, that the electron goes around the nucleus rather like the earth orbits the sun. That is not true. If you're taught that tomorrow, have a word with your physics teacher and tell them that that is not the way it happens until the electron is observed. But before that, it's in a fuzzy, you can't say it's there, you can't say it's going at that speed. One of the great tenets, the great principles of quantum physics is by a wonderful guy called Werner Heisenberg, who I'll talk about later as well, and he said, at the subatomic world, we cannot know the momentum and the location both at the same time because nature doesn't let us. There's no physics reason why we shouldn't be able to do it because we can in the real world. If I pick up the new, I said the real world, in the Newtonian world, if I picked up a ball and threw it, and we knew the size and mass and weight and density of the ball, and we knew the force I exerted on it, and we knew the air pressure, all those things, we could tell you pretty accurately exactly where it will land. Well, you can't do that in the subatomic world. And it's, a, it's, it's nothing works, superposition does not exist in our classic Newtonian world. It's like saying, we can't look at a microwave over there. We can't, you know, we don't see anything happening when we look at a microwave oven. And we can't see super positioning. But it's real and it's uh, amazing. And the amazing thing is we can harness this energy to um, do in, in quantum computers. Richard Feynman in the mid 80s we're only talking 35 years ago. He said, look, we don't understand this stuff, but we can harness it to do mind-boggling um, computations. Because, oh, well, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. If I get into it now, we'll never finish. So again, just remember this, and it's called the observer effect. And then the question comes, um, what if a child's observing it? What if an animal happens to be looking at the camera? Will that collapse the wave function? So when is it collapsed, which is called the measurement problem, which we'll get into. But what I want you to take away from this first experiment is that until observed, Subatomic particles, which means all, all particles are made from subatomic particles. So until observed, um, subatomic particles are in this spooky, fuzzy cloud of probability, which is called the wave function. And it is in superposition. Now, before I get to that, um, Anisha, are there any questions? on this? No, there don't seem to be any questions. Excellent. That means um, everybody understands it or have gone to sleep, one or the other. <laughs> but what I'm going to do now is just play a very short uh, video which um, explains the observer effect and it, it's good to have a quick look at it. This is a great guy. It's all, it's all on YouTube. So let me just play this for you. Quantum mechanics shows us that particles like photons, electrons, and even atoms are in superposition, meaning they can exist in different states and even multiple places at the same time. They are thought to be nothing more than waves of probabilities until the moment that they are measured. This measurement collapses the probability wave of the particle such that it then becomes a distinct particle with distinct properties. One interpretation of this phenomenon 
is that the measurement being made requires a measurer or a conscious observer. If this is correct, then it implies that consciousness has to be an integral part of creating the world that we observe. Could this consciousness then be required for creating reality? Does this mean that there would be no reality without consciousness, implying the universe would not exist unless there was someone to observe it? The answer to this profound question is coming up right now. Okay, so there's a little breakdown of the observer effect. Some people put some questions in the chat. There's two questions. Okay. Uh, do you want to ask, can you ask them or do you want, would you like me to check? Um, I can read them out loud. Yeah, if you read them out, be great. Yeah. Thanks, Anisha. Why does the observer effect happen in the macroscopic world? It doesn't happen in the macroscopic world. Does, did they say microscopic or macro? They said macro. Yeah, it doesn't happen in the macroscopic world. That's the amazing thing. Otherwise, we'd be used to that effect. So this only happens in the quantum realm, but it does happen. And we know it happens because we're building computers out of it at the moment. And the beauty of superposition is that um, up, up to now with ordinary computers, with supercomputers, we have the binary system. So we have a system that's either on or off. We've got nothing that's on or off and everything, an infinite world in between. But now we do. And, you know, with superposition and the beauty is we can map. There's a thing called the block sphere that Terrell did. And by the way, Terrell, that was a great presentation you did on the block sphere. Um, I don't know when I record something, I don't watch all the recordings, but I did watch that one. And I'm going to watch it again, even because it was a great uh, presentation. So well done, Terrell. But it, 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 it's actually, Superposition means it's, it's many, many states and many, many different places at once. And it's all got different probabilities of where it is. And Born's rule will tell us the probability and Schrodinger equation will tell us the wave function over time. But the important thing is, it's got all these um, possibilities that we can now map to rather than just one and zero, we can now, using a thing called the block sphere and using complex numbers and imaginary numbers, because the, if you like, the superposition is almost like an imaginary thing, but we can use imaginary complex numbers to reference to all of those things. Okay, did you have another question? Yes, the second one is, is there a special reason why he used two slits, why not more or less? Uh, that's a good question too. No, you, um, you can, you can't use less. You can't use less because if you've only got one slit, it actually becomes a, a clump. Um, and I can explain the physics behind that. Uh, so there's nothing unusual. It's when you put two, you can put more than two, but then the, all that does is obfuscate the issue because you get uh, a double interference at the back. So there's two is just convenient. Um, but it, it, that's a great question, actually, because if you've got one, it's, it's a clump. The light will always just show straight through like a particle. It's only when you get two that it becomes interference. And that's very, very strange because why does opening another slit change the empirical nature of the interference? And uh, yeah, so that's a, a good question. Uh, should I carry on or do you want to ask another quick one? Um, there's uh, one quick one. Does this mean that quantum properties are deterministic in general? Well, that's a great question. No, it doesn't. Um, it means the opposite. Quantum um, particles are probabilistic in nature, and that's uh, the big thing. Einstein famously said, 
God doesn't play dice. Einstein hated this. Number one, because it, um, I'll, I'll stick to the question. Um, yes, Einstein, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he called it God doesn't play dice because what happens is when you observe, and let's talk qubits when we're doing the computers, the quantum computing, when you measure a qubit, it could go to zero or one with equal probability, but it's truly random. Random, not like random when you choose a random, a number at random. This, this is at a fundamental, you know, universal stage. It, it, quantum physics is, is absolutely probabilistic. We don't know where it's going. It's got a probability to go to one or probability to go to zero. So when it collapses the wave function, uh, how it collapses is, prob is probabilistic. And Einstein hated that. He wanted a deterministic universe. And he said, oh, look, it, this, we're missing something. And he called it the hidden variable. And I'll get onto that hopefully, I think in a second, but he always claimed there was a hidden variable, something we didn't know about. And I'll explain that a bit more when I touch on entanglement, which is next. And Nisha, up to you. Do you want another quick question or should I continue? There's two more questions. Do you want to okay. do them later? I'm sorry? Do you want to do them now or just wait until later? Oh, do them now. I love it when questions should be answered when they're asked because okay. one thing leads to another. So please ask. Okay, the first one is, I, I have wondered if they move the camera to the other side of the first slit between the front barrier and the back barrier and observe the collapse of the wave. Um, fantastic question. <laughs> um, it makes no difference where you put the camera. Uh, in fact, uh, due to time restraints, um, I took a bit out of the presentation, but if we take this camera, um, oh, I, can't, I don't think I can move it physically, but if we take the camera and put it to the back screen, it makes no difference. Um, it will collapse the wave function, which is even stranger because that's bringing in, uh, you know, look away, look away, it's a wave, it's a wave. And then the last second before it hits the back screen, you put the, if the camera has a look, it will immediately collapse the wave function. And please remember that phrase, collapse the wave function, because that's with something that, physicists and computer specialists will say all the time. And all it means is you're observing it, you're measuring. And by the way, the word observer is not the right word. And the word measurement's not the right word. We don't have a word that does that process. And we don't know what is collapsing it because like I mentioned before, a five-year-old boy who just happened to walk past and look into the camera it won't collapse the wave function. But a physicist who's looking to see, to measure what's happening with the particle, it will collapse the wave function. So that's crazy. But that's a great question, whoever asked that question. It, um, you can put the camera when you want, where you want. When you observe it, that's when the wave function collapses. So if you've got a scare, staring at the back screen, it, it will be a wave when it went through the first screen. It will be a wave right up to the second that you observe it or measure it. And that will actually change its... So that's like saying, well, it was a wave, but in point of fact, no, it wasn't. It was a particle all the way along. And the delayed choice quantum eraser will explain that principle very quickly. In fact, that's why we did the delayed choice quantum eraser. It will prove that events that have already happened, this is an interpretation now, so this is, you know, an interpretation. Um, uh, Professor Radden says that it's consciousness 
that actually you know collapses the wave function so um yeah it's um it's really really strange it's sort of like a particle could be coming from a distant galaxy and i mentioned this later it could have lived all its life as a wave but the way we view it when it gets here um if we view it through a telescope it will be a particle if we view it through an interferometer so we don't know where it's come from then it will change its fundamental um, makeup, its fundamental structure. So that means something that's traveled for 10 billion years as a wave now has traveled 10 billion years as a particle. That's what's called a Gedanken, which is a thought experiment. But I'll show you in the delayed choice, this is a good segue into delayed choice, I'll show you what happens and something funny is happening um, as if this is not enough the double slit the quantum um, the delayed choice quantum eraser is even weirder so I can't wait to tell you uh, sorry Anisha another one yeah is the slit experiment related to the Bell experiment Bell theorem uh, uh, Bell's inequalities um, uh, it, it's 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 not related per se, but it's all on on the same thing. It, um, John Bell, who I mention in about the next two slides, so whoever asked that question, well done. These are great questions, by the way. But John Bell um, actually proved that there's a thing called entanglement was happening. You see, what what happens is. Um, you, you can entangle these. In fact, I may just quickly explain entanglement now because I'm going to anyway. But when it's in superposition, you can, um, you, you can get a photon, you can fire it at a crystal, and then you can get two what are called entangled photons. You can get one, put it on the moon, and one here in a laboratory. And when you change the spin on the one in the laboratory, then the one in the moon changes at exactly the same time. This is unbelievable and it's called quantum entanglement. So if you collapse the wave function, what it's saying is that quantum physics has no spatial element. Distance doesn't matter. If you've got entangled subatomic particles, and by the way, the Chinese did this in October between a laboratory here on Earth and an orbiting spacecraft called the Missius. I don't know, 12,000 kilometers in space, which I, I'm not sure of the actual distance, but they entangled photons between here and uh, on the spacecraft. So what you're doing is you're collapsing the wave function of an entangled photon here and immediately and instantaneously, no, no elapsed time at all. Instantaneously, the one on the moon will collapse. Now you tell me, how does the one on the moon know that something a million, 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 million times smaller than a speck of dust has just changed on Earth. Hello, uh, this is Craig. How, how are you? <laughs> Hello, Craig. Yes. Well, very good. Thank, thank you for uh, trying to help. Uh, okay. Um, do you have a question, Craig? Or oh, no, he's gone. Uh, yeah, Anisha. Any other um, questions? Yeah, what is your opinion on the Wigner friend experiment? Oh my God, who asked that question? Give him a, or her a huge tick. Oh, that, oh, I could talk about that forever. Um, uh, well, again, it's, it's an experiment that, sh look, somebody's off mute. Yeah, I'll go through and see who is off mute. I think if you do a control M, it'll mute them all, hopefully not me. But look, um, 
uh, and by the way, I don't know the pronunciation, whether it's Wigner's, Wigner's or Weiner's friend, um, but it's, that is fantastic. And whoever asked that question, um, <clears throat> okay, I'm not gonna go into it now, uh, only because of time, but there, there was an experiment done in the university. Whoever asked that question, do DM Anisha, who'll pass it on to me. But there was a huge experiment happened in the University of Edinburgh just last year on Wigner's Friend. And what's happening to everybody, I may as well tell you all as succinctly as I can. Wigner's Friend is when Anisha and I may be in a laboratory and I say, uh, Anisha, can you just, I'm gonna go down the shops. You, can you observe the wave function for me? And then what happens is I peek in through the window, if you like, and I um, collapse the wave function from outside, which is making her see it from the inside. Um, what can happen, it's, it's difficult to explain in a few sentences, but what can happen is for me, because I've observed it, I know the answer, but um, Anisha doesn't, has, I've collapsed the wave function, but she hasn't. And therefore, is the wave function collapsed or not? In my universe it is, in hers it isn't. And to get back to interpretations, the observer effect is what's called the Copenhagen interpretation by Niels Bohr. And it's generally the main one, if you like. But there's another really exciting one, which you may have heard of, from Hugh Everett called the many worlds interpretation. And what he is saying is that when, when you um, um, observe a superposition, you become part of another superposition that witness friend can observe. It's, you know, who's observing the observer and who's collapsing it. And he has proven, which is unbelievable, he has proven that, and a guy, it's a guy called Massimiliano, Massimiliano Prodietti. Uh, that's the best Italian, I'm assuming he's Italian, um, uh, accent I can do. In the University of Edinburgh, he, he did it with his friend, and he proved that there were two realities in our one universe. It's like an issue and I going into a room and there's a tele for me there's a television for her there isn't it's incredible isn't it because we always thought there was an objective reality and we all interact with the universe in our own way uh, but the universe itself is always the same but this is showing there are different realities it's making hugh everett's many worlds and incidentally to that other wonderful question about deterministic and probabilistic um, Hugh Everett's, and by the way, Hugh Everett was absolutely scorned and ridiculed when he came up with the Many Worlds Theorem in the mid 60s. But one of the beauties of his theory was that it meant the universe is deterministic because the wave function is collapsing somewhere. When I observe it and I become part of it, for me, it's collapsed but for the rest of the world, it hasn't. And, and then what he's saying is there are, um, when it's collapsing all of the time, and um, when I observe it, it may collapse in one universe, but in another one, I've looked at it, and it, um, it hasn't collapsed, or I haven't observed it actually in another universe. So I end up having all of these infinite, infinite number of universes, uh, worlds where, you know, Germany won World War II and the Twin Towers are still existing. So that's what it's suggesting. And as incredible as it sounds, and by the way, Sean Carroll, who you may know, is one of the greatest living theoretical physicists. He's a big proponent of Hugh Everett. But, 
Um, I hope that answers the question, but witness friend is um, a very great one, which um, I'm happy to talk about at some stage. Anisha, do you want me to carry on? There's one more quick one. Does a particle okay. return to does a particle return to being a wave once it returns to an unobserved state? Great question. No. It is forever changed. The superposition is observed once and then that's it. So it can't go back to being a wave. It sort of exists forever. And if you carry on from that, it's sort of saying a particle can, a subatomic particle, which is a particle, because a particle is made up of many, many subatomic particles. A subatomic particle is only real if there is a conscious observer. And now you can start talking, I'm, I'm not a religious person, I'm not a spiritual, mystical person, I'm a, a scientific person, I research science, that's what I do. But I am prepared to accept that when the first subatomic particle ever came into creation, it follows that there must have been something conscious looking at it, which could be conscious itself, it could be God, it could be whichever religion you follow, it could be anything. But no, it doesn't go back and forward. It is. It's like when you measure a cubit. Um, be, when it's in super, and a cubit is a fundamental part of quantum computing. I don't know how knowledgeable you guys are, but anyway, a, a cubit. Once you measure it, it will always be able to a 50-50 probability. It'll be one or zero because that's the eigenvector. It'll go to the highest eigenstate which is one or zero, it will go to one of them and then it will stay there. So if you go and look back, you know, in an hour, it will still be one or zero. Okay, Anisha, should I carry on? Yeah, that's all the questions for now. Excellent. Well, Danny, you're doing a good job there. Now, before we had the... Um, before we had the observer effect, this is now the measurement problem. This is even more important. We still don't understand what's happening. In fact, there's a big saying in this um, um, quantum physics world, you know, shut up and calculate. Stop trying to understand what's happening. Just use the wonderful force. And that's what we do. But the measurement problem was by... You know, in my opinion, the, I love Einstein. I've written papers on the uh, special theory of relativity, and I've got a, on my Kuiper YouTube, I've got an explanation of that, which is time. You know, so time is relative. Um, the quicker you go through space, the slower you go through time. So if I got in a spaceship and went to a galaxy and came back, um, I would be younger than Nisha, which I assure you I'm not at the moment. But uh, that was, the, you know, Einstein was brilliant. But if there were two people that I would say were more genius, uh, more of a genius than Einstein, it would be a guy called Paul Dirac, who did uh, not only antimatter, but he's done an awful lot in quantum computing that we use now in quantum computing, including the Dirac notation. But this guy, John Neumann, and um, oh, didn't mean to do that. Sorry, um, John von Neumann, and I'll get the um, I'll get the stamp up this time. So here's John von Neumann. Now he came up with, wow, what is collapsing the wave function? We know it's in superposition till it gets to the slit or till it goes to the slit until it's observed. We know it's in this fuzzy wave, probability wave, until we observe it or measure it. But at what point does that measurement take place? Now, it's that point here at the measuring devi device, the camera. So is it when we take the photograph, that's the measurement. And it doesn't look as though it is, but I, you know, so, but that's amazing. 
is it then when we get to the eyes of the person? Is that what the measurement has done? Or is it when we get to the brain of the person? Is that when it's measured? Or is it when we get to the mind? And John von Neumann, and, and please listen to this because this is the important thing, um, which is an interpretation. So we know that double slit happens, but this is von Neumann's interpretation of what's collapsing or when is the wave function collapsed. And he said, it's not any of these. It's not even when it hits the brain, the eyes, the gamma, the mind. It is when it is um, in touch with a, what he called extra physical entity. So what, which is consciousness. So what he's saying is, um, the wave function is a quantum object and I, as a human, I'm a quantum object. So I cannot collapse the wave function because I'm quantum. So you just become part of, a, back to weakness friend, you become part of the superposition. You become entangled with what you're trying to collapse, the wave function. So if it's your eyes, their quantum, your mind, your brain, it's not, and this is called the von Neumann chain. The von Neumann chain is not broken until it's broken by reaching an extra physical, you know, do, 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 do. Something that's not a quantum object. And he called that consciousness. Now, let me. By the way, I hoped you could hear the um, sound before, but I'm going to play. Where's my phone? Let me. Um, I'm going to play another video. And they should, with the other video, I can't remember if I've got the. Uh, it clicked. Could you hear the sound? Yeah. The sound was great. Great. Okay. So um, that's all okay then. Um, oh, I need to take my annotations. I need to clear all those drawings. Excuse me for this. And what I'll do is play a short video for you on the conscious thing. And this is Dean Radden, who I'll be talking about in the consciousness. So there's something peculiar about observation. And this is, of course, the quantum measurement problem, which you can, has been described before here, but I'm going to do it in a simpler form. You have some sort of a system which could be a double slit, any kind of physical system, some sort of measuring apparatus. And the measuring apparatus does an observation of the system. From a, a quantum perspective, you take the tensor product between the two quantum systems, the two physical systems, and you end up with uh, the system and the measurement apparatus no longer being independent. So we can say that the two physical systems are entangled. So from a quantum perspective, we're just dealing with complex waves. There's, there's no particle-like behavior yet. John Bell made this sketch to illustrate the problem. Well, where does the measurement end? So if you imagine that you, you have a photon and it goes through two slits and it hits a screen, you might have a photo detector and then you might have a human uh, a counter that looks at the number of times that the photo detector goes off and then the human eye and the human brain. All of those are physical systems. All of them are therefore quantum. Well, why do we see a particle? Why does observation make a difference? So this is sometimes called the, uh, the von Neumann chain or the Heisenberg chain. Where is the cut made? When does quantum become classical? John von Neumann said that the measurement chain ends only when knowledge of the measurement is registered by what he called an extra physical factor. In other words, you, you can't use another physical system to end the chain because it just becomes more quantum. So you need something extra physical by which he meant consciousness. And he wasn't alone in his opinion. Almost all of the founders of quantum mechanics said something like this. 
in various ways, but go all the way back to Bohr and, and even Planck. They all said something like this, and this continues to the present day, as you know. This is uh, today a minority opinion within physics, but nevertheless, it has a pretty prominent uh, background. So I've been aware of this, of course, and everyone offers theories about consciousness, but nobody does anything about it when it comes to this particular problem, the measurement problem. So what we did in, in the laboratory is we, we built a double slit system. And okay. Um. So are there any questions on um, that? Anisha? Um, yes, there is one question. Actually, there's yeah. two. Consciousness is not a quantum object, but the rest of our bodies are, correct? Correct. Okay. Abs and, absolutely correct. Yeah, and the second one is just a request for the YouTube videos and links in the chat so they can review them later. Don't worry about that because, it, oh, it needs to remind me to send you the slides of the presentation. All of the links are on um, my final slide, couple of slides, which I'll give to Anisha so she can put it on our website and you'll get all the slides with all the YouTube links and also I'll put the white papers on there, etc. Do you want me to carry on, Anisha, or do you have a question? Um, there's one more question. How can we start measuring this? How can we start measuring this? Yeah. What do they mean by that, I wonder? Um, consciousness effect. Oh, hello, whoever said that. Say that again. Hi, it's Lorraine, and I'm wondering, how can you start to uh, put together experiments to measure the, the consciousness effect? Oh, fantastic. I, and I, I, I'm just going to go into that, because that's a great question, Lorraine. That's exactly what... Um, Professor Radden, well, oh, you're going to love the next bit. Professor Radden said, as you may have seen on the video, he said, oh, I'm tired of people saying it's consciousness. I want to come up with a experiment that will prove it's consciousness. And you'll find it's not as easy as he first thought. Uh, thanks for that question, because it's very difficult to prove. But that's exactly what he tried to do, and I'll explain that to you now. Oh, before I do that, I just wanted to relate it to quantum computing. Because you're going to hear things in quantum computing, and now you'll know the physics behind it. Um, so I think I've mentioned most of them before, actually. The no cloning theorem is important, the fourth one down. Um, in quantum computers, as wonderful as they are, you can't copy and paste anything. Imagine how frustrating that is. And you can't do that because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now you know why you can't do it. If you just joined a quantum computing course, they would just tell you you can't do it. They'll tell you the cube collapses. They'll tell you the probability of the wave function collapsing at any particular state is equal to the absolute value of the complex angle you squared. But uh, now you know a bit of what's going on in the background. Okay. Oh, I forgot. Yeah. Delayed choice quantum eraser. This, I'll talk about this before we get on to consciousness. I don't know how I'm doing for time. I, um, I know you said uh, an hour and 20 minutes or something. So I've got caught to an hour. That's fine. Okay. This experiment is incredible. <clears throat> and it's only 20 years old. This will, you won't believe this. If you already knew about the double slit, that's wonderful. Not many people know about the delayed choice quantum eraser, which is just 20 years old. It's actually the double slit, but with, with entangled particles. So, um, as I say, it's basically the double slit with entangled photons. And it proves that what people were saying was, if you measure it, then you're interfering with the source of light. Because that's how you measure. You send a particle of light which says, oh, I've hit something or I haven't, and bounces off or back. And 
people were saying, oh, the double slit just does that. It's not collapsing anything. What's happening is um, you're interfering with the actual photo. The DCQE proves that, you, that with no measurement happening whatsoever, and the only difference between two photons is the fact that one, know, one you can know what slit it went through, and the other you don't. And just by that difference alone will, will make the one you know the path collapse. I'll explain in the diagram. And as I said before, it shows us that the future can affect the past or something like that is happening. Now, it's a, it looks, it is a complex experiment, but you only really know, need to know about four pieces of equipment. A BBO crystal, which is a barium borate oxide crystal, a prism. So the BBO crystal gives you entangled particles. The prism will direct the photon. The beam splitter, the beam splitter is a piece of, it's like a mirror where 50% of the time, a, and this is very well known, that 50% of the time the photon will go through and 50% of the time it will be reflected. This is due to polarization. That's why it's so good. Photons are better than electrons. It's all, it's all the same. And then the detector board. So here's the experiment. This is what it looks like. And as I say, it was only done in 1999. What I, I'll do is I'll get my trusty stamp out again. And I will show you where everything is. So the BBO crystal is here. So as soon as the photon comes through the top slit or the bottom slit, it hits the BBO crystal. And then you have an entangled pair. So you've got an entangled top pair. One goes this way and the other goes that way. And you've got an entangled. Uh, try and, um, if you can, mute yourselves, please. And then the bottom one, entangled photon goes, one goes up and one goes down. So that's all that the BBO crystal is doing. Then you've got the prism here and the prism there, a Glenn Thompson prism. And all that's doing is focusing the photon where you want it to go. Then you have the beam splitters. We've got three of them here. Now bear in mind, so when a photon comes here, 50% of the time it will go through to hit this normal mirror. And 50% of the time it will come back here. Um, and then you've got your detectors, detector zero, uh, one, two, three, four. And they're there so that we know whether it's a wave or an interference. Now, I could literally take hours and hours explaining this experiment, but if you can roughly follow what I've just said, then um, I will now explain why we've done it this way. What I will do is show you I'll compare detector zero, and it's the same for the others. I'll, de I'll compare detector zero with detector three. Now, with detector zero, we don't know which slit it came through. We cannot know, because it could have come through the top slit, or it could have come through the bottom slit. We don't know. So can somebody tell me what pattern we would expect at D0? Would it be an interference pattern or a clump? Uh, you can answer in the chat, but because we don't know, it is a interference pattern. 
it's it's exactly the same as um, Thomas Young saw in 1801. He saw an interference pattern because he didn't know which way it was going. He wasn't measuring it. And here, we simply don't know which litter went through. Now, compare that with the D3. I can see lots of questions, so Anisha, keep on top of that. When we get the photon here, when it hits D3, now half the time it will go through, but ignore that. When it reflects and hit D3, it could only have come from the bottom slit. We know the path it took. We've not measured anything. We've not done anything. But we know, or we have the ability not to know. Um, so what pattern would you expect at D3? Yes, you guessed it, it's a clump. And that happens all the time. Now, that is amazing. So it's like the same photon going through into the system. The only difference is that we know which, which slit it went. We know the which way. So that is pretty heavy. Um, now, and if we compare, you, could, you can do all of these in turn. If we look at D1, D1 could come through the top or the bottom. It could have come through the red. It's gone through the beam splitter. It's hit the mirror. It's gone through the beam splitter, and it's here. Or, I have to... <laughs> yeah, so, or it could have come through here, through the prism, through the splitter, through that split, oh no, that's not right. Oh yeah, um, up to this and then not gone through, bounced off and come here. So at D1, again, it would be an interference. The point is, it's always the same. If we know where it's gone, it can, uh, it will be a clump. Now, it, could this get any weirder and the answer is, this is quantum physics, and yes, it can. <clears throat> Let me explain. What happens is, with the entangled photon, it gets to D0 first, before its entangled photon has gone through the process of reflecting, going through, reflecting, going through. We don't know where it's, it's up to probability where the entangled uh, photon will end up. But here's the amazing thing. So it takes longer for this to go through. But when this goes through and it's a which way, like at D4 or D3. So it, it's, so we know where it is and that will be a clump pattern. On D0, we will have a clump pattern. Even though we don't know where it went, the entangled photon somehow knows what's going to happen with its entangled photon when it goes through this system, which is called the quantum eraser path, where it goes through, where it bounces off or it doesn't bounce off um, in probabilities. It will change if, um, if it goes to a clump pattern, then D0 will be a clump pattern even though its entangled partner hasn't gone through the maze yet. Now, we must have some questions on that. <laughs> Anisha? Yep, there's one question. Could both beams go to D0? Um, 
No. Uh, no. Both, and that's what the prism does. So both photons, the same photon, the both entangled pair, each of the entangled pair can't go to the same, what well, it could do, but we deliberately make it not. That's what the, great question, that's what the GT prism does. It splits them up because we don't want them to go to, the, that wouldn't tell us anything. What we want is one to go one way where we know it's going and then the other one to go through this indeterminate maze of beam splitters and so we don't know where it's going because the whole point of the uh, delayed choice um, experiment was to show that when all things are equal except we know the path of one of them then it will be a clump or a interference pattern and they were this is only 20 years ago um yeah any other questions so even i have a question this is Lorraine. Oh. so um and i don't think i can type all this <laughs> so okay that when you have these entangled particles <clears throat> somehow the particles know that their entangled partner is going to be measured and so they turn into a clump even before the measurement occurs correct oh my gosh <laughs> oh uh, lorraine i love you and you have such a great accent <laughs> i was thinking about you <laughs> yeah look you got it in one you got it exactly right and um, that happens it happens every time no always but we don't know why. So the interpretation is somehow does the future affect what's already happened in the past? And that is the interpretation. Um, Anisha, I may just go on now because I've really got to get through the consciousness in about five minutes. Yeah. You can come back to questions, okay? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, this is the galaxy thing, which, uh, God, I hate to go quickly through this, but remember the quantum eraser that Lorraine has just pointed out? Well, if we um, use a telescope to look at a, a photon from a distant galaxy, and then we know where it's come. But if we, got, if we got the light, and we didn't look at it, but we put it through what's called an interferometer, we would not know where it's come from. So that photon, which has traveled for 10 billion years as a particle, its whole history could be changed. Or well, not could be, would. Well, and this is a Gedanken, a thought experiment. So in the delayed choice, the, the difference in time is, a, is 0. 0.00000001 of a second. But Wheeler, great guy, was just saying, hey, doesn't matter how small the difference in time is, um, it could be 10 billion years. Okay, I have to quickly go through the, the random exper uh, experiment. So he sort of said, look, I'm gonna prove it. So someone asked before about how can we prove its consciousness? And the answer is we really can't. So it's an interpretation if you like. But what Professor Radden did, he used, he had people, he, he got his own double slit set up, and then he got transcendental meditators from India, Tibet, Nepal, these people who were in touch with their consciousness better than your average person. He did two distinct groups, and what happened was the light came on and they had to focus on a, a photon going through one of the slits. Long story short, the transcendental meditators were significantly better than ordinary people. Um, he then went from into different rooms, no difference. Different countries, no difference. Over the internet, no difference. But over the internet, and he's got 80 gigabytes of supporting data. And also he's re reproduced these experiments 
and they have there's a thing called the sigma testing the hunt for the higgs boson the god particle got to something like three sigma and they got a nobel prize for it and dean radin got to four sigma and he's saying what do you guys want from me but over the internet was amazing what he did was he they did it over the internet, but they wrote a Linux simulator. So what was happening? They would send, they would do the experiment, a light would come on, the computer of the person, the person would focus for 10 seconds, and then it would go off, la di da di da But what he did was he sometimes, all that data, he simulated it, and then he had a real human on it. And then again to a significant result, the uh, human data, where there was a human present, it collapsed the wave function. When it was just a program, it didn't. Wow. So, you know, that's why that, again, I want to stress that's his interpretation. And he's saying, hey, everybody, here's the proof. But it's not science yet. Only last year, Wallace and Von Stillfried did a critique, and they said, "Look, it's a false um, positive. It's, and that's when you know the outcome of what you're going to do, and therefore that makes you biased without you even subconsciously knowing it. You favour a result, and that they would have, you know, and." Again, I've got links to all of the critiques so you can go through it. Dean Radden responded to that. He, he said, you know, you're not happy. But uh, he wasn't happy and he said, they said he wasn't doing enough and he said, I'm doing more than other experiments that have been approved. So it's still an ongoing thing. Um, yeah, so... One thing to know about the um, false positive, it is real. There was a big experiment called the OPERA, O-P-E-R-A experiment, where they showed that the neutrino was going faster than the light. And they actually did the, they reproduced the experiment, it happened every time. And it was science for about five years until it was proven that it was a false positive. People wanted it to be faster than light, if, if you like. So I won't go into all that because it's a scientific paper. As promised, here's the YouTubes and here's many references. And YouTubes again and research papers. And, and Nisha, that is that. So amazing. There is. It is oh, for you. Since there is a time delay in the two results, can you do something to change the entanglement or really the future does affect the past? Um, I uh, could do, sorry, can you say that a question again? I was trying to change the screen, I do apologize. Um, it, say that question again, sorry. Yeah, since there is a time delay in the two results, yeah. can you do something to change the entanglement or really the future does affect the past? Well, you can't do anything to change the entanglement. I'm not sure what they mean by that. Um, so they are entangled. And um, yeah, the whole point of it is that there's this time gap, which, which, which shows this amazing thing. Look. It's, it's down to interpretation. Um, yeah, it's, it happens. So if it happens, you have to say what's going on here. Fundamentally, it's really, now this, I hate, I'm not speaking science now. I'm just talking to you as a friend. <laughs> I'm just telling you my opinion. Time does not exist in the quantum world. We quite often hear about the universe. How did the universe begin, of course? And, um, it, it, you know, how can something come from nothing? And the answer is, in the quantum world, it happens all the time. Things arrive before they've got there. It's all 
very, very strange, and Paul Dirac's done a lot of work on that. Now, it's, it's time does not exist in the quantum realm. This is me speaking. So it doesn't care that it's the future changing the past or the past changing the future. The quantum world doesn't, doesn't get hung up on it, it because it doesn't exist. And I might just add, there's a thing called temporal quantum or quantum temporal entanglement, which is even more amazing. And what, what happens is you entangle two particles, then you entangle one of those particles with another one, and then you link it on. And then in the future, you create another entangled partner that entangles with that one. But what that means is, if you go back to the first entanglement, it means you could write an encryption code that's actually written on an atom that doesn't exist yet. It only exists in the future. So it's amazing. So that's my interpretation. And there are other people's interpretations. But I hope that answers the question. Um, they asked a follow-up. So measuring the entangled photon will collapse the wave function of something that happened already? Yes. So when you measure anything, it collapses it. So um, the collapse yeah and now we're talking about when does the measurement take place um but the first one will collapse before the it entangled partner um, but somehow it knows to collapse as a clump when it hits a detector when it's entangled partner in the future hits its detector so i hope that answers that question the next question is, what types of effects could a human consciousness have on the particles, signal, signals, energy, etc.? Oh, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm not the right person to answer that because it's a, it, we're, I always say about quantum physics, the beauty of it is that it combines um, uh, cosmology, metaphysics, theology, epistemology, it, 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 it really is in charge of all these, it connects all of these wonderful disciplines. So when you talk about the power of consciousness, it, you know, the jury is still out and I want to make that very clear. But there is a thing, if, if Radin is correct, and let's face it, it looks as though he is. And let's face it, he's not alone. John von Neumann believes it, or uh, believed it. And a lot of the other pioneers believed in something similar. Um, so anybody who says it's not consciousness collapsing the wave function, they haven't got an alternate um, answer. So it's the best we've got at the moment. So when you're collapsing it, if it's a five-year-old boy or a physicist, the physicist will collapse it and the five-year-old boy won't. But it's not the physicist collapsing it. It's his consciousness that's ostensibly collapsing it. So it, it's strange. Look, it's all strange. It's weird, but it happens. And it happens all the time. And the amazing thing is that we can harness it to produce mind-boggling computations, which is what we're doing now in the quantum world. Does anyone else have any questions? For the person who said, can you talk, tell us about the talking topic because you were late, we will be sending out the recording to everyone who didn't, who signed up but was unable to make it. But yeah, doesn't look like there's any more questions. Excellent. Yeah, we will send out a recording to everybody. Cool. Okay, thank you everyone for coming. We're, we're really happy to have you. It was an amazing presentation. Thank you even for having everyone and doing so well. And yeah. Have a nice night.
wherever you are, whatever, wherever part of the globe. Thank you again. Thank you very much and uh, talk to you soon, Anisha. And goodbye to everybody and thank you for your attendance. Thank yeah, you so if, much. Yeah, if, you, if anyone has any questions, feel free to email community, contact us and we can send them over to Eman. And we will send out a recording as well with the slide deck. All right, bye everyone. Bye Anisha.